seeing the presence of a quorum, call to order this meeting of the Amherst Pelham Regional School Committee. Uh, it is our first of the year. It is being recorded um, for future broadcast by Amherst Media. Um, so welcome everyone back. And the first order of business is approval of the minutes of June 25th, 2019 and August 15th, 2019. I hope people have had a chance to look at it at this point. If they have any uh, edits or also accept a movement, a move, uh, but I'd like them separate, I guess, of these items. Yes. Um, on the August 15th minutes, mm -hmm. um, on the list of in attendance, um, it's a small thing, but Leverett does not have an E at the end of it. Oh, okay. No, that's great. Leverett. Okay. <laughs> Anything else otherwise? Enough? Yes. If you're accepting edits to the oh. August 15th minutes, uh, I just wanted to clarify uh, in the second page how to organize meetings to be efficient. Uh, one, two, three, four bullet points down. Consider day long meetings similar to contract negotiations where the budget can be reviewed in large sections to assist with making other meetings more efficient. Mm -hmm. uh, I believe that was a point that I had made, and I actually, what, the point of that was uh, not to help make meetings more efficient, but instead to help school committee members understand the budget for the upcoming year, better okay. understand the budget for upcoming okay. year. So I'm wondering if we could... Um, mm -hmm. Can we have the change? We have the change. Okay. Terrific. Thank you. You're welcome. I'd also entertain a motion, as I said. Who wants to make one? Okay. I move. So we move to accept the minutes for August 15th and June 25th. Okay. Uh, so is there, is there, individually? I don't think you have to do it individually. As, as amended, I assume. As amended. Is yes. there a second? Second. It's been moved and seconded. Uh, any further comment? Any debate? Seeing none, all those in favor of approving the minutes as amended, signify by raising your hand. They carry unanimously, which in this case is eight to nothing. Um, okay, the next item of business is committee announcements and public comment. Uh, I have an announcement. Answer. Yes, please. Um, so I have a family member who works at the middle school, so I contacted the state ethics department to ask about potential conflict of interest, and on the recommendation of the attorney I spoke with, I have filed with the Amherst Town Clerk the disclosure of appearance of conflict of interest, which is the project. Um, then for the Collaborative for Educational Services, uh, of which we are a member, um, the CES supported uh, Amherst Regional High School students and staff in producing a youth-led vaping prevention filmmaking project earlier this summer as part of their Healthy Families Spiffy program. The CES also met with staff at Amherst Media and demonstrated a successful collaboration with local filmmaker Ally Pinchmitt. And then the next board meeting of Amherst Media is Thursday, September 5th at their headquarters. The next meeting of the Collaborative is September 25th at their office in Greenfield. And the next meeting of the School Equity Task Force is Wednesday, September 4th from 6 to 8 in the library. Terrific. Are there other, actually, it's a good opportune moment to say if there are other uh, subcommittee updates from the summer, we welcome hearing any said updates. No further updates. Uh, okay, uh, so at this time, uh, we'd accept public comments if we're actually behind our agenda. So I'm hoping if people wanted to make public comments, they would have taken them, they were going to be able to take the time to come here uh, when the agenda item is open. Um, keeping it open for just a second longer. most scintillating television you could possibly imagine. <laughs> Second to, I guess, editing and approving minutes, right? <laughs> That's probably number one. Somebody comes in, I guess, in the next couple minutes before 6.55, and they did, in fact, have a comment. I want to reserve the right to be able to give them an opportunity to speak, but otherwise we have business and there's no reason not to move on. Um, so I'm going to close public comment uh, with that notation. So next item, the item on the agenda is superintendent's update. Sure. So this is in your packet um, and the, uh, the attachments came as a separate document, so I apologize about that. So, yeah. And so I'll roll these through these uh, pretty quickly. So our summer programs update. There was 123 students who participated in the high school summer school program. That's uh, generally students who either are taking courses for credit recovery or to take care of um, prerequisites to um, have more elective options. 
So the courses range from U.S. history, math, right, clearly um, required courses. Um, we ran a special course, as we discussed last spring, for students entering calculus next year, some of the concerns in the math preparation. Um, that, that uh, were voiced last year. We responded in that, um, both from the staff and student perspective. It seemed to be a very successful experience for students to get them more ready and, and feeling more prepared and, uh, as they transition to calculus. Health, physical education, those are often courses that sometimes students want to take in the summer, so it opens up slots for them during the academic year. And we have some electives like art as well. Um, 60 students participated in the VELA program, so just want to um, connect to Ms. Ordonez's comment. So uh, that program is a collaboration between us and the Collaborative for Educational Services. Um, that was great to get to see them because they're in the building that I'm in. Um, Three-week program was highly successful. And we had 37 students uh, in grades 7 through 12 who participated in the special, uh, special education summer program. So if you had all those students together, you know, in the order of you know, a little over 200 students, um, that's roughly a fifth or 20% of the students at the region. So you can see that our schools run, um, well, the school year technically ended last year, June 14th. We have a large portion of our students continuing to extend the school year into the summer programs. Uh, two weeks ago, we had our three-day administrative retreat. That's the attachment is um, in the packet. And um, I think uh, perhaps worth coming back to this document uh, more when we talk about Schedule for the year in school committee meetings because some of the topics we uh, we discussed at that measure retreat should foreshadow topics we talk about um, with the committee and the community. Uh, fantastic backpack project uh, once again. Thanks to Dr. Guevara and her staff, Liz Haygood, for volunteering her time to come in in the summer. We had over 400 backpacks uh, given away, and thank you to the Amherst Police and UMass Police Department. So they were on site issuing and installing car seats. So some people mm -hmm. just said, "I'm not sure it's in right." Uh, can you look at that? And they actually had some that they were donating as well to families, uh, which is a fantastic uh, experience and just really a wonderful service. Um, so we had families come in who weren't even getting a backpack. We just, just, you know, for those of you who have had children, you know, it's not the most convenient to find someone to do that. So just to pull up to the middle school, get that done on site is, is a great service. So thank you to them. Uh, we had a teaching tolerance grant that we got. Well, that was uh, received, a platform received by a member of the Amherst Public Schools. It actually has implications for the middle school as well uh, around civic literacy and organizing. So um, sort of like an answer to questions. I'm trying to be cautious with time, but um, it's really nice when we have these experiences that span multiple districts because there's, there are kids in sixth grade. There also are also our kids in eighth grade. And thank you to Mr. Austin for his leadership. He, he received the grant last year, and then this is an expanded grant to expand beyond sixth grade of Fort River. Can you do me a favor? Yeah, please. Can you just talk a little bit? I mean, I, I yeah, think sure. you, the way you just described that, I'm not sure you've actually yeah. described any of the content of the grant. Sure. Like, what does it do? <coughs> sure. So uh, I'm going to read directly from the press release um, one paragraph. Thank you uh, for that. So thanks to the newly awarded $10,000 grant, the Civic Literacy and Organizing Unit, which was done at Fort River, which um, essentially encourages students to pick a topic of interest. Uh, build their knowledge base, and then encourage them to advocate and organize around whatever the topic is. There's no leading. There's not like, it'd be great if you, like last year, you know, was the Green New Deal. I met with a number of students who were really focused on that. That's not based on adult encouragement. That's based on student interest. Um, and really, the encouragement is for them to become owners uh, about their advocacy and not have it driven by adults. Um, the adults really are facilitating the learning and also the process by which advocacy occurs. Um, and um, so this this same kind of structure will be expanded to um, the in the, relevant for this district, the eighth grade at Amherst Regional Middle School. While teaching the unit in each school, teachers new to the project will receive coaching and training, equipping them to teach the civic literacy and organizing unit in 2020 and in future years. The grant also covers um, an organizer in residence, and we used that last year, who assists the staff members both in terms of training but also what ways there are um, to organize and, and to teach students to literally the organizing skills, whatever it is they want to advocate for, who to get in touch with, how to do that, how to build popular some more support, in this case among both their classmates, but what's been really neat is we've seen it, um, students go into their communities, their neighborhoods, and, and try to build, build the literacy of their community, not just students, their, their, their peer group, but adults as well, um, which wasn't necessarily like exactly designed as planned, but when students get excited about organizing and their passions are realized, that's what happens. And we want students to learn those skills, learn how to organize and advocate for things they feel really strongly about. Um, it also fits really well with the new civics um, mandate that came from the legislature last year, so it's a happy marriage that way. Thank you. Thanks for the encouragement on that one. Um, facilities update. 
So uh, major capital projects that were completed, uh, we refurbished the high school girls' locker rooms. That's been discussed at this committee meeting, be this committee before. Um, we finished the high school gym floor, repaired the middle school elevator. Uh, I think we've mentioned here, but the middle school elevator has been problematic for the last couple years, and it's critical in a two-story building without a great ramp, certainly not one inside. Um, it involves going back outside the building. So that, that repair was complete and the inspection um, done so that we will get many more years of life out of that elevator. Um, and I, I use these terms major and minor. They're based on my terms. These aren't Mr. Roy Clark's terms, just to be really clear. Uh, but we inspected all the school roofs with additional, additional patching in multiple locations for this district, particularly at the middle school. Deep cleaning throughout the schools is wrapped up, I should say, and time for school opening. And we've uh, employed a new checklist to ensure cleanliness so that there's consistency across our schools, across the districts, actually. We check the operation of the ventilation systems, the exhaust fans, you know, things that are really challenging to do, but frankly, in the winter when you can't get to them. Um, and if you could get to them, there's piles of snow on top. Um, things you have to be concerned about, uh, we have to be concerned about. Um, one of the things that came up in the 7 through 12 report last year was a focus on preventative maintenance, mm -hmm. that because the age of the buildings and there's so many, so many of our uh, systems are at the end of their life um, or planned lifespan. So we did a lot of work on preventative maintenance this summer to understand where the problems are, fix what we could fix, um, but also to know what are going to be challenges in the, as we head towards the winter months. In terms of the fields, um, which you know I hope we come back to as a full agenda topic in the near future, we purchased a new water cannon, as you know, and attachments. Uh, worked with DPW to improve the playing conditions of the athletic fields. I want to thank DPW for their steadfast work, um, working with coaches, um, the athletics department, as well as myself. Um, the field issues haven't gone away, but in my opinion, these are the best the fields have looked um, in the last three or four years. Um, and some of that was them letting us know what the needs were. That irrigation, actually, they found was the largest need uh, for the fields at the current time. You know, there's, there's more global needs with the fields, but the things that would get the fields more playable, um, and based on the location, particularly the field hockey field, it wasn't quite um, possible to irrigate it the way it needed to be irrigated without an additional piece of equipment. So we completed that, and the fields are in better shape. Can I take a question now? Please. What is a water cannon? It is, uh, and I, that, I, I'm told that's not a layman's term because it felt like a layman's term to me, but it essentially is um, a machine that can water fields at great distances, uh, and it can do it automatically. So in the past, the, the way that made most sense to me, in the past, the machinery they had, someone literally had to keep on moving the, um, the irrigation, uh, the watering, whatever system was in place, and uh, multiple times um, to get across the fields, which really slowed the progress. So they said they can irrigate three times faster with a water cannon than they could prior, and that's a huge difference for the fields, particularly in the hot summer months. So the three times mm -hmm. faster was the thing that sticks in my head that made it mm -hmm. more clear to me. Um, uh, on the back, we had an excellent start to the school year on Tuesday. Um, we welcome back our new staff members. Um, thank you to Chair Nakajima for welcoming, uh, spoken on behalf of the school committees uh, and welcoming um, the staff. This is the one opportunity we have all year where all staff are in the same place at the same time. So it is really wonderful. And it's experience. not recorded. It is so not. So for those committee members who didn't choose to attend, it will remain a mystery <laughs> as to what did I say that created laughter there was and, a, laughter. and appreciation. I would agree. Um, well, maybe on the chair's report, you'll hear. Um, <laughs> uh, I want to thank new uh, the uh, APA president, Mick O'Connor, also addressed the faculty um, and staff. And we discussed how to support all students to feel welcomed and supported starting on day one. And sort of an interesting aside, uh, not to go too deep into this one, but um, I use a program called, uh, use the program called Mentimeter, which is uh, kind of like you can use your phone and you can vote on things. And there was a word cloud, if you can think of what that is, so people can type in a word or a phrase. <coughs> And Excuse bless me. you, in real time, it pops up on the screen. And the question was, how do you want students to feel supported? How do you want them to feel, excuse me, how do you want them to feel um, as they leave school on day one? And what was really fascinating, a staff member emailed me this, and I think it's worth mentioning, how often um, the word safe, and it wasn't talking about physical safety, to be really clear, safe, supported, included, you know, and, and a, a veteran educator emailed me saying how interesting it was that if we'd done this 10 years ago, would those same words come up, love, loved, was up there, belonging, and uh, it was just, a, it made me reflect because that wasn't, it worked really well with what I was going to say following. It wasn't a, you know, it, it was, it had a rhetorical uh, use, but it was a really interesting reflection on uh, how sensitive our educators are to how 
you know, students in our world feel in 2019. And I've had some interesting discussions this week with faculty and staff, uh, unprompted by me, about that very item, how uh, the word cloud lets more people who say a word, the larger it shows on the screen. Um, so it's just really fascinating, but I think it said a lot about our, our faculty and staff and how they think about um, young people. Uh, hiring update, so we'll have a full hiring update in November, um, as it has previously been done, but I wanted to offer an interim update. So uh, we had 40 new teachers, new educators, professional educators at our um, training last a week from today, a week ago today, excuse me. 18 of those 40 across the three districts identify as people of color, uh, which identically matches the number of students of color across the three districts. Um, this is the first time on record, I mean, I imagine when it was a totally homo homogenous community, perhaps. But uh, in, in my 19 years in the district, I know we've never been close to that number. Uh, and, and equaling that percentage, I really want to thank um, Assistant Superintendent Cunningham, who couldn't be here tonight, our principals, uh, and the community, because it involved the training of everyone who wanted to be on a screen committee uh, or an interview committee around how we were going to approach interview processes, how to reduce bias. And uh, our principals, you know, definitely coming from Ms. Cunningham and myself, coming from you all, understood the, the importance that that um, representation really matters. It matters to our students. And so we'll have a more full update um, again in November, but since we had this day last week and, and we had 40 people, and looking at those numbers, I did think um, the committee should be updated on that. Yeah, Ms. Greenland? Is 40 a typical number for new hires? It's a little high. We're usually more like 30 to 35, but we had a large number of retirees last spring um, just based on how the cycles work. So it's a bit higher than normal, you know, uh, probably about 20% higher than normal. Uh, first night in the common, I saw many of you there. So um, some of you just enjoying yourselves, some of you chasing kids in some combination, <laughs> which is essentially what my night was as well. Um, but, you know, we had a lot cooler weather, so we didn't need the water sprayers this year, which was, which was nice. But huge turnout, thanks to Jadira Torres in particular, who is really the brain trust of, of that event and does an incredible amount of work on it. And uh, just every year, just uh, I get so much appreciation from the community for coming together as a community before the school year. That it's not just the school committee. School community. Uh, we had you know people who support us. We had over 700 slices of pizza donated from area vendors, um, <coughs> which was great. Um, and uh, just a great way to start the school year. And for people who stopped by, as well as people who stayed for many hours, and, and Cub Scouts in particular, I have to thank them. They stayed well beyond their allotted required <laughs> or committed time because they had the climbing wall and get, the line just was long and they just stayed until it was too dark to, for kids to climb. Um, they also made homemade live donuts on like a grill, which was, <laughs> I enjoyed. What's a live donut? I should say they had a donut that they were making in front of us uh, on like a, on a grill surface, which I'd never quite seen before. They were delicious. I call it a fresh donut. That is a more appropriate term for it. Yes, I'm sorry, <laughs> Gina. Um, and uh, I have a couple more, some that aren't written. Uh, so in the window into ARPS, uh, Victoria Stewart is a new athletic director, and Michael Gallo O'Connell, shoe nutrition director. Uh, that came out on social media today. It'll be released tomorrow in the Friday update. Thank you to Amherst Media um, for their quick turnaround. We also had an episode with Mr. Jones, the high school principal, is here, so we did that in the summer. So we're already ahead of ourselves with two episodes down, and Ms. Westmoreland's taking a very large role in scheduling those out, actually. We've, I think we're scheduled out through the no end of November with dates and, and guests, so we're being more organized in this kind of new organizational model we have at district office about that, which is great. So um, three other quick updates. Um, Summit Academy, just remember last year we spent a lot of time in the move and how that finished, you know, everything I heard from people there and went over on Tuesday, just it was such a smooth start. You know, last year between the move plus still, you know, some doorknobs needed to go in, it was, it was a real challenge and staff overcame that. But I do want to note, uh, appreciate um, where we are now a year in. Because sometimes we do the change, we don't come back and talk about it, and I think it's just worth noting that. Um, the second newer update is, um, Today, I was notified that um, in terms of Triple E, mosquito-borne illness, we're in an area that is considered as raised to moderate risk um, mm -hmm. based on some things happening in neighboring communities, not happening in our community. We're in close contact with the Amherst Health Department uh, about that. At this point, they're suggesting that no actions are needed uh, in terms of changing the evening events and things like that. But we'll monitor that, and we will um, certainly let the committee as well as community know if, if there's a different recommendation around that. Um, there was some uh, incident in Hadley, you know, with animals, not with people, uh, and then one in Granby uh, with horse. And so 
Uh, at this point, we're following our directives from the Amherst Health Department as well, and they're connecting with the State Health Department. Um, but if that changes, you know, there will be implications for athletics and other evening events, and we'll certainly keep the community informed. But at this point, the information we have is to not make any changes to current practices. Um, I just wanted to ask, I know that this has been in the news recently, yeah. and um, and I actually had seen a low risk, so it's good to know that it's been in just increased. Yeah. Um, I'm wondering if it's possible to share with uh, landscaping staff to make sure that there's no standing water that's right. around the schools and all of that. Has that advisory gone out to, to staff? So I got this... Uh, communication about an hour ago um, so but you're absolutely <laughs> right that that we will we'll have to do on our internal side mm -hmm. around that piece but um, the directive and, and also you know just logical things if, if our staff is working in tall grass wearing you know there are precautions for staff um, but at this point that's where they're saying the limits are just staff precautions but not um, that we need to change community events um, but absolutely so this sounds like a good item to get like to assume that at your next superintendent's update on the 10th? Yeah. Um, even if the answer is it's gotten better, yes. uh, just say something. Absolutely, <laughs> absolutely, yeah. Yeah, it's literally an hour ago that I got an email from the town uh, about it, which is how that information flows to me, so. Thank you for the quick update. Yeah, no problem. <laughs> and the last one's a more fun quick update. So um, last year, the, uh, historically, the town and the schools have had an event uh, that involved the Puerto Rican flag raising, and it's been done, Mr. Sardona spoke at it last year. Um, uh, there were two issues with it. I mean, it's a wonderful event. One, it was done at a time of year where the weather didn't always cooperate um, with wanting to be outside. And the second larger issue, actually, for me, was it was done, in, and it's historic, but it was a celebration connected to, colon, uh, my words, colonization, you know, um, Columbus and the discovery, quote unquote, of the island. Oh. And so Dr. Guevara and I spoke last year, and both of us weren't comfortable with continuing. We wanted to think of another option. And so there's a holiday in Puerto Rico called um, Guita de Lares, and that is a celebration of an uprising against the Spanish colonialism um, in the mid 1800s that led to, um, in, that in and of itself led to kind of more, um, what we talked about before, organizing um, and advocacy of the Puerto Rican people, and it happens to be on September 23rd every mm -hmm. year. I've been to Lares um, about 10, 15 years ago. It's an amazing historic site. And so we have shifted with the town's support to have that event to honor, similar event in terms of flag raising, but doing it on a different day and with a different purpose and I think a different mentality. Mm -hmm. uh, we always sort of were apologetic for those of you who went about, we're celebrating Puerto Rico, but we're sort of, you know, it, it, I don't know how you felt. I, it's always felt awkward to me. Mm -hmm. um, and so we decided to do something about it. So we're going to have that celebration. We don't have a time yet, but um, this is also like after this was printed this afternoon, we were able to resolve it. Uh, on September 23rd in Town Hall, um, or mm -hmm. around Town Hall. And so more information will come with that, but I just wanted to share because it is coming up sooner than it has in the past, and also to understand why we changed the, uh, the date. Um, and I say about the weather, it'll probably be pouring rain, but at least it won't be snowing, which we had a little bit, was it last year or the year before? Slushy. Slushy, yeah, slushy yes. Slushy cold, yeah. Yeah, yeah, so <laughs> that I think we're, we're going to be safe on. But uh, we have students who attend, um, and I know Dr. Guevara is... is working with the schools about which students attend and how to organize that day and the town participates as well. But we're, I, I'll just say I'm very pleased that we, we're taking what's been a wonderful community building event and actually expanding um, and maybe clarifying the scope to be consistent with what we want it to be from an ethical moral lens. Okay. Are there questions, other questions for the superintendent? Seeing none, we will move forward. Um, so for the chairs, uh, report. Um, I have three things uh, to update folks about. One, and I'll, in, I'll invite uh, Mr. Donius to, to jump in on this one. Um, through the advocacy of uh, the really the excellent leadership and work of Senator Comerford, uh, and also through the advocacy um, for people who have been following this or been on the committee, you know that Mr. Demling and Mr. Donius have been leading up advocacy on behalf of the committee. And uh, uh, two things uh, occurred. One was that there was a, a, a small amount of money included in the budget. And it's going to sound crazy because a small amount is like $7 million. But in the context of a multi-billion dollar budget, that's a small amount of money, particularly when you imagine the number of school districts that could potentially be distributed over, in which case it actually immediately could just do the math. It could be a really small amount of money. Um, but either way, meaningfully, it was being put into 
uh, mitigate the impact um, from uh, charter school tuitions yeah. on, on school districts. Uh, and in particular, I just, I'm just calling this out, the advocacy that our committee did, some of the work that Mr. Demling sent in had a direct impact on it, which I think is just really a testament to the, the desirability of keeping and persevering and keeping up with this work, whether or not we see a reason to or not. It can actually have an impact, particularly if you have a senator like we do, who's gonna pick that up and, and run with it. Um, so, uh, so that's one thing, but also just today, um, we had a phone call with um, Senator Comerford, and as importantly, uh, and if you know Beacon Hill, some ways more importantly, um, chair, uh, the chairperson of the Joint Committee on Education, uh, Senator Jason Lewis, who uh, is, was interested in, in hearing a little bit about the, the pothole money business, but that's really in the hands of Desi to distribute at this point. Um, what they were more interested in doing is saying, look, we're gonna be entering into a legislative process this fall around Chapter 70 revisions, and um, we want to hear from you, as well as Pelham, as well as Amherst, you know, the weird sort of, we have multiple committee thing, uh, and also Northampton, which has had some significant issues right now. And so we had a half an hour. That doesn't sound like a lot of time, but actually mm -hmm. it can be if you're really well organized. And also, besides that, um, the senator uh, chair, both senators, but the chair, deeply to his credit, was in listening mode. And so it was really taking notes and listening to what we had to say. Um, I don't know where this is going to go, especially because the, the feedback I think we got was that they hear us, they care, they're not sure what the next step's going to be, but they, but they want to think of it. And so I'm sure this is going to engender more work uh, on our part to try to be responsive, but I think the mere fact that our, may, may, you may, I'm sure the committee is aware, and if you're not, we should talk about this in a future meeting, that the Promise Act, which is a tremendously beneficial and important piece of legislation and a topic in the Chapter 70 reform, um, which is going to benefit a lot of districts that really have deep needs in the, in the Commonwealth, will only benefit us kind of a little bit. Um, if you look at the mass budget analysis, um, Pelham District gets another 61,000, Amherst another 102, and I couldn't quite figure out what the region got, um, assuming Amherst would rent the elementary district. Uh, and so... Uh, it's not a lot of money in the scaring scheme of, of, of the amount of money going out to charters. Anyway, so just that, I just wanted to, you to be aware of that, but also because it, it, the way that the senators were talking about this, it directly related to advocacy that we were doing and the desire, the need for us to keep it up, especially as we're going into the fall. Yeah, that is stuff you want to add to this? The only thing I wanted to add is just that, uh, just to make sure that we mention um, that chair, the chair of the Pelham Committee, uh, Sarah Hall, was also on that call did a fantastic job, I think, representing the yeah. challenges of you know a very small town that is in Western Massachusetts that is part of our mm -hmm. region, uh, and how deeply felt the charter impacts are. Um, any small changes to the budget can completely upset um, the budget for the schools, and she did a fantastic job just explaining that. So for the benefit of our committee members from mm -hmm. Pelham and then also for the community that may be watching, important to mention that, and also to thank Dr. Morris for sitting on that call uh, in the middle of everything that's going on the first week of school. We really appreciate your being there, uh, just in case you know we needed some of background information and all of that, but you and Mr. Mangano actually um, had helped us quite a bit beforehand in preparing for that call. Yeah, and so, it says a lot, too. I mean, just the mere yeah. fact that you had the introductions ran slightly long because th there were a lot of us on the call <laughs> trying to really... Um, be present, but also add ideas and thoughts where we could. And I think the cool thing about it is if you're from the Shrewsbury or Leverett or Pelham or the region, uh, and then Northampton, which has its own sort of issues and is, is a consolidated district, um, if you look at our region and you look at the fiscal struggles that all of our districts and towns are having, um, all of those types of districts were represented on the call. And so I felt really good about the fact, and Anastasia, and, sorry, Ms. Ordonez, organized some of the, the pre-work with Northampton to try to make sure that we were well organized so that when we did have only a half an hour, but it is a full half hour, that we could take the time to make sure that all the communities were well represented. And I think you did a great job representing Amherst. Thank you. The team did a great job. Yeah, no, absolutely. <laughs> uh, so that's one thing. We had to keep at that. Uh, the next thing is uh, that we, uh, as I mentioned at the very last meeting, and you can even see it in the minutes in the chair's report, um, uh, Mr. Mangano and uh, the superintendent and I did talk about and work on uh, the regional assessment information uh, this summer. Appreciate Mr. Sullivan for his, his input as, as it's come through the, the pike. And um, 
in essence, I'm just going to preview this for the, the committee and really the community and anyone watching. Um, if we thought last year was rough, this year is going to be rough. And, and we understand the reasons. We understand the fiscal challenge. We just talked about it a second ago. We understand the very real fiscal challenges all of our communities are feeling. We're not demonizing anyone for it. But the reality is um, we're coming at mul multiple forks in the road mm -hmm. about how we can find a way to come to agreement around a regional assessment that can work for all our communities. And I don't know. I, I'm being very blunt and very honest when I say I don't know how we're going to do it. I don't know how we're going to move forward. Um, and, I, and I think literally it's important for you to know that at the first meeting of the year, for one thing, because you're going to see more action on this topic earlier in the year than you might otherwise, because we, we have to. If you, and I'm just going to be very clear about this because we remember the history. If, if, uh, if one of our towns barely passed the regional assessment last spring in their town meeting, and there's now some indication that they are not sure they want to do so this year, we have to take that seriously. We have to take that communication seriously. We have to think about how we work with one another um, to try to see if we can resolve it. Um, so I thought I'd throw that out. And then really the third item is something that came up. Um, as people may be aware, it's an obligation. If you are a chair or have been a chair, or if you ever become a chair, <laughs> um, you'll find out that one of the things you do during the summer is you end up meeting with the superintendent um, on sort of an as-needed basis to keep up on things that are going and uh, keep apprised of issues that are bubbling up in the office. Sometimes it's as a sounding board, and, and from my sense of how it works, it's not like the superintendent's ever going to talk to either me or for you, what other committee you're on, your other chair's committee, committee's chair, and just do something. They're not going to make a decision without the full committee, but they sometimes want to have a sounding board. Um, and, uh, and so for this summer... Something that um, we've been talking about is there, there's been, you know, some sort of rumbling of community uh, concern, particularly among some individuals around how our budgets are organized, how management decisions are being made, the efficacy of some of our, of our staff. Um, sometimes that com those comments come in, um, and they've come in, by the way, in volume to members of our staff, to leadership of our staff, as well as the school committee. And sometimes it comes in more like a, a sort of straight shot topically, like I'm concerned about X decision or Y decision. Other times it's much more blanket in terms of a broad question of how uh, we're in, uh, the, the district's engaging in its work. And then to be blunt, sometimes it comes in in ways that if you look particularly in conversation, this is why I'm going back to the conversations I've had with the superintendent. If you look at some of the emails that have come in, particularly to staff, sometimes they have a tone or quality to them that is much more uh, personally charged mm. uh, in terms of potential accusations or characterizations of people's competence, of their work, or even of their judgment and character. And uh, I'm, I'm raising this for a couple of reasons because when you're dealing with this, you end up having, and I'm saying this, I'm not trying to say this um, pedantically. I mean, I'm sort of engendering a conversation that we're going to have to have about this, is, um, you know, we have obligations as a committee, and we're going to talk about them more in just a little bit around how we conduct over oversight, how we set policy, how we supervise this, the superintendent and the work that he's doing, uh, and then also set the budget. Um, I think we do have an appropriate role as a recipient of public concern, um, but then the question ends up being, how do you how do you best and appropriately channel and respond to those concerns? And I think it be, the more that the, the, what comes in over the transom, to use an old-fashioned term, or your email inbox, the more that what comes over the email inbox is sort of a blend of what could appear to others as being personal attacks and policy questions, the more challenging it gets, frankly, to respond to. Because you can have a meeting to talk about um, how we're running X or Y department, but when it's overlaid with questions about people's character and judgment, then you have to think about, well, what are our personnel policies and personnel mm -hmm. laws that the superintendent's following um, to appropriately manage staff? Um, if it's the superintendent, uh, him or herself, uh, what's our obligation as an employer to receive uh, potential accusations if they're substantial and, and manage them appropriately in a way that maintains that person's reputation while also ensuring that we're conducting our business in the best possible way we can. And then how do we also um, make sure that while we're doing all of that, um, particularly if the volume of the emails runs occasionally into the dozens or even the hundreds, um, how do you ensure that you're not losing sight of the broader business that you're here to conduct? 
meaning how do we make progress on a strategic plan? How do we make sure we solve problems like I just mentioned or in regional assessment? That takes enormous energy and work to do. And it's hard to do all of that and also chase down um, every critique that we can possibly receive as a committee. Um, I'm throwing that out there not because I immediately have a solution. Um, I've talked to the superintendent and our next meeting is gonna have this topic on the agenda in a more fulsome way. We have, this is our first meeting of the year. This is our first opportunity to meet and talk in any way. It's, I don't think it was appropriate. I didn't want to sandbag the committee with um, some sort of discussion or deliberation on something that they haven't had a chance to think about um, or to receive any materials for. Um, and so I know if there's a public expectation that we do talk about this, um, we're going to talk on September 10th more about the subject. Um, I also think, though, that frankly, if we're going to, it's probably going to be in the way I just described, in which some things are questions of how do we conduct oversight over departments and appropriately review budget, and then other things are going to be about how do we separate the wheat from the chaff if people are being uh, feeling like they're being accused or harassed in some way, uh, whether that's a legal term of harassment or not. And I think both of those things matter when you think of not only conducting our business appropriately, but also ensuring that the morale of the district is as high as possible. So that's kind of that. And I apologize it's done in the format of a chair's report because it doesn't really allow for much debate. Um, but, uh, but we'll have a chance to do that. And I appreciate all of your yeah. time. Uh, look at that. We're, on, we're only slightly behind. Um, maybe we can make up time. Oh, sure, Mr. Funch. A couple of questions. Uh, you mentioned assessments and actions. Can you be more specific about what you mean by actions? Did I say actions? Yes, you did. For the summer or for the fall? <laughs> I think I assumed it was for the fall. For the fall. Oh, um, we're just, uh, okay. So, and by the way, uh, I, I welcome uh, Mr. Mangano or the superintendent's yeah. uh, ideas on this, but essentially what we need to do is reach out to the four individual towns that are members of the district and understand if they have a position that they've developed or if they have some sort of guidance, what is that guidance? Um, this is not, I mean, as you know, Mr. Munch, this is not a new topic. This is like, this is a, this is a perennial old topic. So there's not a single committee that we're going to talk to that's going to say, hey, what's that issue? Explain it to me. They all know. And so the question is, how are they approaching it this fall? Um, if they haven't made a decision, how are they going about making that decision? Since I'm being honest and very clear about the fact that it's poss there is very much the possibility we could have a failed budget um, this coming spring. And we, we actually know right now there is distinctly the possibility we'll have a, a failed assessment and then what flows to that is how do, you, how, do you, how do you approve the budget and how is it paid for and all that kind of stuff. Um, we decided we needed to get out in front of this conversation early in terms of, in other words, instead of waiting until December to engage the towns at a four-time meeting, we need to engage them like now or in September. Uh, and so then we'll have to bring those conversations back um, to this committee as, as we as we can and as we need to. Do you have anything you want to add, either one of you, please? I'd welcome it. Oh, Sean. <laughs> oh, this is working? It's good, okay. Um, I think I include you on this email, but um, I was invited to the Shutesbury Finance Committee meeting, which is the same night as the next regional school committee meeting, um, just to be sort of a listen to the conversation. So I'll have more information to bring back to the full committee after that meeting. So at least within a couple of weeks, there'll be an update on the topic. But am I right, though, that yeah. we're gonna, you're yeah, going to be reaching out to other towns? Absolutely. Like that too. Yep. Yeah. So, so the Shutesbury, the Shutesbury Select Board School Committee and Finance Committee is meeting on September 17th instead of like December 17th to take this on yeah. and see where we're going. Mr. Bunch. Yeah. Um, I don't know if this is possible. The, the budget for initial review comes out in December, correct? Yeah, please. So um, it, can I answer a question but offer a broader? Sure. I'm just also cautious of not an agenda topic. Um, so um, so I think our budget, and you can see this you in the last. You shouldn't debate it. I mean, I think we're if there's factual information. Just, that yeah, I was going to go to. I think that's the point. The last page in your packet has our sample. So typically it's in January that the initial budget comes out. February, a detailed budget comes out in March. And, and so the other thing typically is in December, we have a four-town meeting. And uh, the only thing I'd add to the comments earlier is um, if 
think what I'd, I think I'm restating something the chair might have said, but perhaps in a different way, is I don't think we can wait to the four town meeting um, to start having discussions about how towns are feeling, which, you know, not that there was no discussion before four town meetings, but it was typically that first four town meeting is like, here's an overview of where we might be situated. Here's what we're hearing about the state. Here's some known variables. Um, because I think the conversation around budget amount and budget assessment method are two really different conversations, and they always are, but perhaps this year even more so. <laughs> Please. And the, and the other factual piece that's going to be very difficult for the conversation to happen early is that the information we're going to need for the statutory method to find out what it looks like won't come out until January. So we can make guesstimates, but depending on what the state does and the legislature, those guesstimates could be off, you know, significantly. So. Just stay yeah. where you are, please. <laughs> um, I've always been concerned about the January time um, because select boards start their conversation and discussion about budgets long before January. Right. And I think one of the things that is really problematic are surprises. Um, is there some way to, without going so far as to commit to something, to provide information beginning now um, about what particular elements or components of the budget might look like? So maybe I could start. I mean, I think the challenge is that if, if we are thinking that the one town or more towns may want to go to the statutory method, particularly towns of Levin and Shutesbury because their enrollments, the share of the enrollments from the elementary and secondary play out um, particularly awkwardly because they're not connected to our other district, uh, other districts. Here, it's really hard to forecast and, and I would argue sort of, um, we don't want to put out bad information mm -hmm. and it's possible that we'd have pushed to put out information too early, we'd be putting out information that we then regret later. The funny part about it is on some, so by the way, I think up into this point, I think we've been, we've been actually genuinely updating the committee on something we did this summer. I don't want to go too much further right. on this before we're, and also we're going to have this future item. Um, so uh, the only thing I'd add to this, I, that I want to why I asked you to say the microphone, is unless I'm wrong, my recollection is that your feedback from Desi was that A, um, if, uh, if, it, if the t four towns cannot resolve to come to an assessment methodology and pass the associated budget, um, that two things happen. One, you are actually forced onto the statutory method for the purposes of town assessment until such time as the four towns agree right. on an alternative methodology, yeah. right? Okay, so in other words, if, if one town fails to pass it, we really can be forced onto the statutory method if they st yeah. stick to their guns on it. The other thing is we're put on a 112th budget, and I think if I'm less, uh, this is where I want your guidance on this. Is it a 112th budget that's based on the proposed budget, or a, the reason, and by the way, yeah. forgive me for saying this, the reason why this is important is, if you don't understand this, you don't understand why it's an emergency. <laughs> because essentially what we've learned over the summer is that, um, in fact, a town can force us onto the statutory method, which based on the enrollment space, the enrollments between the different schools and um, the, the relative inputs into the statutory method, we know that would cause substantial dislocation to how much uh, the other towns would have to pay. Right. A lot, like a jarring amount. Yeah, and, and just the one clarifying piece is so we would get forced on the statutory method while the towns continue to work on a permanent method. But there's still, to, before we get to a final budget and a final method, the towns still have to agree to something. So the statutory method is basically what the, the state will use as sort of the interim method to allocate that 112th budget um, in the meantime while well, the towns are figuring it out. So what I'll do is I'll try to get more yeah. packet of information that walks through the entire process because um, there's been a number of regional school districts that have had to go through that this year, one just to the north of us. Yeah. Um, so there's good recent information on what that process looks like. So we, we, need, we need to move on. If there's, a, if there's a factual question of clarification, you can raise it. Otherwise, I really want to, I don't want to, I don't want to have us to be actually genuinely discussing and debating a topic that wasn't on the agenda. Did you answer Eric's question, 112th of these years, or 112th of the report, the proposed budget? I'll have to get the specifics. My understanding is it's sort of a discussion um, about what you need, okay. but. Okay. And, and, and can you explain what you mean by 112th? Is that sort of like month to month? Yeah, like exactly. They'll give you sort of a, they're going to look at your budget and they're going to release the money on a month to month. Um, so assessments would be on a month to month base, basis. Right now they're quarterly, but it would be on a monthly basis. Got it. Thank yeah. you. Okay. 
Mr. Hart? Yeah, I, I want to move on to another item in your report. Oh, sure. Okay. That's okay. Um, it had to do with um, the uh, public um, communications to either the superintendent or to other staff members regarding a particular staff member yeah. and crossing the line of, um, what's the word I want to use, um, acceptability, um, what have you, that doesn't become borderline libelous. Um, yeah. How are we? What, what's the what's the the body of information that we're going to be using, if any, to be able to discuss this issue? Uh, so I think I think it's a really good question. Something that is still in thought process, and it's one of the reasons we're not having that discussion tonight and I think you know we want to make sure I want to make sure and I think we want to make sure that any discussion on the 10th is, is grounded and bounded uh, by mm -hmm. both evidence as well as uh, you know a discussion of policy well that, that's sure that, that's the reason why I pose the question yeah. because I just need to have a sense of what I'm going to be looking at if we're if we're going to be making some decision about policy or something else. And actually, um, to, yeah, to be clear on that, I don't think on the tenth we'd be making any decisions. No, I, the I, decision. I'm just going to be clear about this. The decision we might be making might be to develop policy, for example. You know, in other words, and out of that would then come some sort of product. Um, and, anyways, I, 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 because this is a fraught topic, I almost want to leave it there to say that the reason I looked at the superintendent is that, um, for a variety of reasons, he's been concerned and has expressed to me a concern that the district actually doesn't have really good policy, meaning not just the school committee doesn't have good policy, but the school district from a man personnel management perspective doesn't really have a good policy to guide it in thinking about um, what could otherwise be an unusual circumstance in which, I mean, there are policies on the books about how students behave with each other. There are policies on the books and, and managerial practices around how staff treat each other. Um, and obviously staff and students and such, um, there, there actually isn't good guidance on if, if a member of the staff feels uncomfortable in some way, and it's sort of specific, not generic, uh, around um, something that a member of the public does or a body in the public does. Um, and, you know, what, how do you approach that in a way that respects, um, completely respects free speech rights and the rights of, of you know, redress and grievance but at the same time also understands that it is a work environment and it is a workplace. And there are there, there logically are some protections or some guidance that people need to have as employees feeling safe in an environment and supported in an environment. Yeah. And we don't have it worked out is the point. Yeah. So that's why I want to kick it to the next meeting. Yeah, and I don't want to I belabor, understand that. Yeah, yeah, and I don't want to belabor it, but I think it is worth noting that the context is broader than this moment. So this is a topic that came up in another committee I work for, and I can say it, I suppose they can't, but in, in another committee last spring, um, we heard public comment around this general topic, and just very bluntly in Pelham, it's in the public record. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think the broader context is more important than the moment in some ways, right? Um, so I, wanted, I don't want the context to be made to be uh, acute or super specific, because I think there really is a broader context that's existed many years before this moment in multiple committees and not just our own. And I think it's an important thing for me to note that um, I think if we're responding to a moment that, 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 you know, one could have that conversation. And for me, it's a broader issue with broader implications than, than this particular moment in this particular district. Abs and that's, I think that's really well, I think that's really well stated. And I, I want to move on. Yeah. But it's really well stated just because I think that the entire point is you, you, you want to make sure that 16 months from now, a whole new set of characters and all the rest, that whatever you put in place um, feels appropriate and feels well grounded in terms of good management policy, but also sound legally, ethically, from a public perspective of a public body. And, and that's exactly right. You'd never want it to be guided by any particular thing at all, ever. Uh, we gotta move on, because also I'm worried now that we, we had such a tight and good agenda to like get down on time, <laughs> and now I'm worried that we might lose that. Um, and by the way, just as a, as a final comment, um, I'll, I'll, I and I think Mike will take feedback either at the end of the meeting or some other time on whether you like the agenda or how we can improve it. 
So hopefully you notice it's different. <laughs> and the difference tried to reflect what we did at our, uh, at our retreat. Uh, annual planning for superintendent, school committee. Uh, so uh, superintendent roles, responsibilities, uh, goals, discussion, and the calendar. Um, I, I mean, I, don't, I think if people on the committee have something they want to mention around the superintendent and committee roles and responsibilities, uh, I, would, I would welcome it. Um, I just think it's important to probably good to lay that out as we go through this exercise. Really? Um, so I, I think that it's, uh, you know, in context of a lot of different conversations that we've had in the past couple of years, quite frankly, um, it keeps coming up over and over again, some confusion sometimes among the community about what the roles and responsibilities are of the committee as it pertains to oversight of the superintendent, uh, but also even other administrators, and then what our general, you know, task is for this committee. Um, are we, you know, a legislative body? Yes. Are we representative of the community? Yes. Um, but then it kind of breaks down on a day-to-day -day basis. You know, how does the school committee and how do individual school committee members actually, how are they expected to engage around issues of importance to, you know, parents, caregivers, teachers, et cetera. Um, so I, I, you know, I think it's important for school committee probably on a regular basis, maybe it's annually or biannually, I'm not sure, uh, to review what our objectives are and what our responsibilities are for the, you know, it, both the edification of the community, but also even for our own edification so that we're clear on that. I think, you know, many of us have talked previously in retreats and other places uh, we go through the uh, charting the course, you know, training from the MASC, and that's great for understanding sort of basic roles and responsibilities for school committee members in the state of Massachusetts, um, and that's required training when we first get elected to this position. Um, but it's held, you know, more or less behind closed doors as part of the training that, that MASC runs. Uh, it's not something that is shared publicly necessarily, and, you know, the public can access the information if they go to the MASC website, if they, you know, access the various uh, documents that are produced by that organization and others. Um, but it's hard to find, and it's not something that it's readily available and, and always at our fingertips. So I'm not quite sure you know, how we could go about something like this. Um, perhaps it's something that, you know, if, if the committee agrees that this is important, that maybe it comes up as an, a future agenda item, uh, you know, with, with preparation. Maybe the policy committee can help guide some of that, that conversation. Yeah. Uh, perhaps working with the chair. I don't know. These are just things that I've thought off the top of my head. Um, but I think it would be extremely beneficial both to the district, and hopefully to the superintendent as well, uh, but certainly I feel for the school committee. I've heard it from enough members individually at different times to feel like this is an important thing to bring forward to the committee as a body. Mm -hmm. <coughs> so I agree. <laughs> There's a void I felt like I needed to fill in. Uh, no, I, 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 I'm kidding. Uh, no, I, I, I agree, and actually I think, um, I mean, for the purposes of tonight, I think we know as a broad brush that um, the budget, uh, hiring the superintendent, supervising their job, working with them as they're setting their goals, um, providing follow-up on how we're making progress, and then those goals being, I think, integrative into whatever strategic planning uh, that the district has as a whole are, are some of the key tasks that a school committee has. And it's one of the things we talked about around uh, in further in this agenda, because I think a lot of this agenda is going to be considered a work in progress right now. Like the rest of items one or we're going to talk about tonight, but we're probably going to come to resolution after tonight, um, is trying to figure out how do we tighten up our, our, our calendar for the year. We want to have shorter meetings. Um, we want to make them productive. Well, if we're going to do that, then it, it's even more incumbent upon us to explain to both each other <laughs> and the superintendent and the public how we're organizing ourselves and why. Because one of the things that you've heard me say before, because I'm a stuck record, is um, if, we're gonna, if we're going to be tighter and more focused, it means there's some things we're not going to be able to talk about and we're, things we're not going to have on our agenda. And what the public has to understand is, hey, if we need to, we'll put it on the agenda, if there's a reason to have some discussion. And um, we've done that many times. But that um, otherwise, because something's not on the agenda, it doesn't mean it's not important. It doesn't mean it's not great work of the, 
of the of the committee in the community of the community rather and of the district. But honestly, we got to get our work done, and we've agreed to a set of things we're going to try to make progress on, and then that's how we we set our agenda going forward. So, what do you think of the idea of creating some kind of a PowerPoint, maybe in tandem with the superintendent around? the roles and responsibilities of really both parties, because it doesn't work if we just do the committee and then we leave <laughs> off what you do. Because then it'll just seem like this big black hole where like, who's doing the rest of it? <laughs> oh, oh, they are. Yes, Manu. Could you include in that PowerPoint presentation a role, if any, in the review process of superintendents hiring decisions? Because you didn't mention that in terms of the overall goals. Yeah, I mean, I mean are we supposed to are we supposed to get involved in hiring and staffing decisions? I think I think that needs to be included in that discussion, that description, I should say. Mm -hmm. I think that's exactly right. I'm look, kind of looking at you. Yeah, no, I. Because <laughs> you forgive me, and for the public a minute, no, this is the chair of the policy committee. <laughs> Hello, Ms. Hello. Um, no, I. I really agree and that was actually one of the things that coming out of our, our retreat that I, I found really really useful and and also I was um, reading I'm only halfway through the book that um, superintendent generously gifted us at the end of last year and and I think there's a lot of good models in there um, and something that I, I think is really important particularly if we want to make sh you know the idea of keeping to our short meetings but really focusing on the work that we w we want to do, we need to be doing, and that the community expects us to be doing. Yeah. Great. Does that? I guess I'm seeing nodding heads that people think is a good idea. Or yes, please. So um, just one thing to add is that um, I think if we do create some sort of document or PowerPoint, we should definitely link to it on our website. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Maybe where our contact information yep. is. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. um, so it's available to the public who may not be reading our minutes or attending our meetings. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's mm -hmm. great. And I think that also would allow you to link potentially to other resources outside of the district. Mm -hmm. Like the other day, um, Mr. Jonas and I were talking about the um, like best practices of how to be a chair guidebook that the MESC has. And it's a cool document. And uh, rather than summarize it, I'd say it's available on the web. Go read it. It's not that long. Please. Um, a question as a new committee member here, I guess. I'm. It sounds like there are certain things that the, the school committee is obligated to do like reviewing the superintendent and doing the budget. So from my point of view, it'd be interesting to understand how you decide what other things you're going to take up, which I guess you would put in the category of not required but would like to do. Mm -hmm. So how do those how do those decisions get made? Where where does that come from? Would be helpful. Sounds like from a great my thing point to include. To understand. Sounds like a great thing to include in your PowerPoint. Yeah. Although by the way, we're about to discuss <laughs> some of those in a moment. <laughs> so we'll revisit, we'll revisit part of the answer to that topic when we get to item III. Uh, actually, no, before that, when you talk about your, your stuff. Um, is there any other, f I mean, I think that's a great action item, so I'm going to leave it there um, unless someone has anything else. They do not. Awesome. Uh, so item two on this is superintendent goals initial discussion. As we say here on the item, um, we're gonna, you're going to refine this into a set of goals that will be presented to the committee for potential approval on uh, September 10th, 2019. So today you're wanting to review the themes and get feedback, right? It is, yes, absolutely. And I think the context for me that um, I'm looking for specific feedback, not just on what I'll share. And, and this, for those who are in Amherst and Pelham, I'm using the same format we use where I'm going to orally share kind of 10,000 foot ideas. I'm not sharing specific goals tonight because I want to get a sense of where the committee is, particularly on prioritization because where I'm struggling in this particular district is I have eight ideas for goals. I think eight goals is going to be too many for a whole host of reasons. Um, and particularly because the fact that most of these eight are specific to this district. So in past years where there's been similar amount of goals, there were many of the goals that spanned two or even three districts. And that's not the case this year. And, you know, so I'm really interested in things that the committee would want there to be as goals, as, as, as distinct from things that great you're working on, love to hear updates, not necessarily rising to the level of a goal that we need okay. that level of artifacts and regular updates about. So uh, you're going to talk through all eight, but then you want help. Exactly. Exactly. Okay. So I'll just, I'll, I'll go down a minute. And again, these aren't written as 
in the structure of goals. So uh, I'll say number one is really developing a comprehensive framework on wellness that includes uh, issues such as substance abuse, LGBT inclusion, and homework load. Um, that's not a new topic. I think it's actually, there was a goal similar to that last year that I think rightfully was not, um, I would self-rank in the committee rank, not as, as completed as some of the other goals. The second goal is to, around the successful implementation of new math curriculum in grades seven through 12 uh, with evaluation measures of student, family, and staff experiences as well as student achievement data. I spent a lot of time on math last spring, but it actually wasn't a goal because it sort of emerged later in the school year. The third one is um, collaborating with the town of Amherst um, and the school committee to develop a plan for future improvements uh, and enhancements of the athletic fields. Fourth one is something I mentioned, referenced earlier about the updated data, but continue to diversify our staff through refinement of our new hiring process, processes and training of staff and community members who participate in screening or interview teams. Fifth area I have is really around late start time, which we dabbled in a bit last year. Um, we've got a little more comprehensive transportation report. Thanks to Mr. Mangano for being a key, per key person in that that I'd like to come back to this fall one way or the other, but I'm trying to assess Important, order of importance because that's a topic that if we want to dig in, it's going to take a significant amount of time, energy, and resources. A sixth topic is around um, the study of sixth grade to the middle school, the educational study of um, sixth grade to the middle school that looks to wrap up in December. Um, the seventh section is uh, really around the strategic plan, so complete the initiative section, which is the uncompleted section at the current moment of the strategic plan, uh, begin implementation and evaluate the evidence um, of where we are and how we're doing with that. And the eighth one, uh, and I struggled whether this was a distinct goal or not, but I'm, for now I just want to share it with the committee again to gather feedback, is around um, supervision evaluation of staff. Um, as you know, I've reorganized some, some things in the district offices so that I can be more present in schools and providing um, not just the when there's a crisis or as needed, but real coaching and, and authentic feedback throughout the school year. Um, so those are eight distinct areas that um, I looked at, like, could I combine some? And I really didn't feel like at the end of the day, like they're each distinct and I know they're all important, but I guess I'm looking for feedback uh, and some prioritization as well as what perhaps is missing uh, from the list. Mr. Fox? Um, would you please repeat number seven? Sure. Um, and these are written in shorthand, otherwise it would have had a more formal document presented, but the thing I'm looking at is not, wouldn't be terribly helpful to anybody. So number seven was um, to complete the initiative section of the strategic plan, begin implementation, and evaluate the evidence of progress. Okay. Actually, I want to ask whether members of the committee need anything yeah. else, because what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to go around the committee and give each member a chance to provide their thoughts. Um, and I'm gonna do it like the usual run around the room sort of thing. Because otherwise it'll force me to pay attention to who's spoken and who hasn't. And that's you should have told us that. That's <laughs> too <laughs> taxing <laughs> for me. Yeah. So why don't you run through them very quickly sure. just for yeah. the interest yeah. of what was just said. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So the first one was develop a, a framework on wellness that includes issues such as substance abuse, LGBT, LG, LBGT, excuse me, inclusion, and homework load. Second one was um, successfully implement the new math curricula in grades seven through 12 um, with evaluation measures. Third one was along with community partners, um, town and the school committee develop a plan for future improvements of the athletic fields. Fourth one was around um, continuing our efforts around staff diversity and continuing to make progress in that regard. <coughs> Fifth one was to deeply explore late start time Sorry, I see Kip's face shifting as I say that, those phrase. But um, sixth is uh, to around the outcome of the study uh, and further discussion with the community about sixth grade to the middle school. Seventh is to complete the initiative section of the strategic plan, begin implementation, and evaluate the evidence um, of progress. And the last one is the supervision and evaluation of staff. Um, and when I'm saying staff, I'm talking about administrative staff. I directly supervise. I'm not talking about... Um, teaching staff or paraeducator staff, um, given the you know, slightly revised um, district organization. I want to actually comment, it's not just that eight goals is too many for the evaluation process, although I believe that to be true given the three districts. It's also that if we focus on all these things and meetings, 
everything we just talked about uh, at the retreat, you know, I think there's going to have to be some scope um, that um, myself, the district staff have, but also for the committee, because um, that's a lot of things I just mentioned. And, and I guess the feedback I'm looking for is what are things that we need to, we're, we're not going to not complete a study or we're not going to, you know, avoid things, but in my opinion, that, that will fill up our calendar in ways that um, we may feel like we talk about a lot of things and don't get anything done and no one's going to be satisfied okay. with the outcome. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start with an email that I got from Mr. Demling. Yeah. That then I, I'm going to offer this note that since he didn't know you were going to introduce eight items tonight, he can't answer the question now of uh, which ones would he prioritize. So instead what I'm going to do is note ones that correspond to your list. So I think that's the most appropriate thing to do. Uh, six, sixth grade to arms was on his list of something he considered to be important to prioritize. Uh, early start time is another one that he considered to be important to prioritize. Um, vaping, pot, stress, wellness framework. I mean, forget the details, but my point is the, the wellness framework also was on there. And then actually, interestingly enough, um, he talked about sort of time and building super, supervision, but I'm going to translate that into your supervision. Yeah. Um, one. So that's his feedback, which now means I've just given everyone else a longer chance to um, prepare your thoughts. Serena, I'm just going to run. So what we do, by the way, just so you know, is we run around the table. Mm -hmm. And so if he's first, that means you're next. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and you you can say pass, and then I'll get back to you. Okay. But if everyone does that, we're not we won't get anywhere. Okay. Well, I have a tie for first, but um, the first continue the discussion of diversity, the achievement of thereof, uh, the problems in doing it. Second, a close second, would be the sixth grade to arms. Uh, third would be the implementation of the math program. And <clears throat> fourth, I don't understand vaping. I, I can't believe kids are doing it. Oh. Uh, it's beyond my comprehension. Uh, so an update on the wellness and vaping situation. It, Um, okay, well, I would certainly uh, go along on the wellness. Um, I, th I think some of those issues are really becoming critical. Um, I think the diversification of staff. I'm actually going to put the athletic fields in here because I've been on the athletic fields and I know how, I mean, I can't believe, for example, that they run track on the track. <laughs> And I think the athletic fields affect a lot of kids. Um, and then, I, you know, I'm not quite sure where I would go after that. But I guess those are three that I would certainly like us to look into. Please. Please. My turn. Um, I guess I would use a prompt to identify what I consider to be of high priority. And my prompt is cell phones. Um, cell phones, I think, are a very broad issue, um, but they're a symptom, I think, of a much deeper issue, which is the mental health of kids. And I would like to see that included in wellness. Um, and I think a lot of kids who fall under the, the, the title of the groups that you identified also experience challenges to their mental health. But I think, um, I, I can't help but think, and I have no evidence, scientific evidence to prove it, but I can't help but think that the, the massive use of cell phones and screen time is uh, an indicator of something going on with kids that we don't fully understand. And I think it's related to mental health, the isolation, the alienation, um, the inability to directly converse with other kids. Um, I think that's a serious problem. And I, I don't know how to address it, but I would really like to have a conversation about what steps we could take. And just in general, to look at the mental health of kids. Um, I think it's a bigger problem than we are willing to acknowledge. And I think it's also related to late start time. Thank you. So probably a, a lot of overlap. I, I went through and I ticked off like, well, these are obvious, and then I couldn't think of what else <laughs> should be. But I got stuck with what should come off the list. But um, 
I'm actually and curious that um, none of us mentioned the strategic plan because I do think finishing that up is is, is really important. Um, and and so part of me sort of goes through which ones do we call out as as objectives versus work that is going to be happening anyway. Mm -hmm. as, as, as you mentioned, I think you described it as it's important. It just doesn't necessarily get discussed at, 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 on an ongoing basis at these meetings. So perhaps that does fall in there as it's work that's going to be happening. But I think we as a committee would want to um, be hearing about that, mm -hmm. that process and, and contributing where we can help. Um, the other ones that I have on here is um, the sixth grade to the middle school. It, you know, to a certain extent, how I prioritized them was what are things that are going to be on our list no matter what we decide, and that I think is one that's going to potentially come on our list no matter what we decide as a, as a priority, that we're going to have to talk about it. Um, I also have athletic fields um, for a very similar reason. That also has much broader impact sort of beyond beyond our, our, our school district, um, and so I think, again, sort of, in terms of what is going to be a priority or what's going to be made a priority for us, whether we want to or not. Um, the, then I also had later start time. Um, thinking again, sort of as part of the wellness, I find it hard to imagine making student wellness a priority or a goal and not including that as part of that. Um, so that's, that's, where, that's where I stopped. Some of the others in terms of diversifying staff and, and continuing that work. Um, to continue the progress that's being made and continue the work that's being, you know, evaluating our hiring process and, and sort of constantly looking back at that. I feel like that's important work that should be continuing, whether that rises up to become on the short list of objectives. Um, is a question mark? And then same with the math curriculum and implementation. Of course, that's important, um, but it feels being a parent with kids in the middle school and the high school is feels smooth so far. There's some bumps, but I, I, you know, getting an update, but is that a top priority for updates? It's a question mark for me. Okay. <laughs> um, I really appreciate the amount of time that you've obviously spent thinking about this. I, I see reflections back from the evaluation that we just had last year. Uh, and, you know, I appreciate that <laughs> continuity. This is, it's great to see that. Um, I'm loath to prioritize these, even though I recognize the importance of doing so for your sanity, but also just for effectiveness, right? And also for the committee to be able to engage uh, in the community. Um, but I guess, you know, I, I'm also thinking a lot along the lines of Ms. McDonald, uh, her point around the strategic plan. There are certain elements of this that I think uh, fall under the strategic plan, and rightfully so. We spent a lot of time talking about the strategic plan, you know, with Mr. Nakajima's leadership and yours. Um, and I think that we did, and the community did, a lot of great work in putting together a strategic plan that reflects our values and our mission and everything. So I believe that by putting uh, attention to completing that, um, and then especially thinking about how we evaluate the evidence of progress, that that's extremely important for the upcoming year and beyond, right? So as we establish a precedent for that continuity of, you know, uh, superintendent goals, this is, this is a big one. Um, I also think that, you know, given that, uh, underneath that, the diversifying of staff, continuing that work is also extremely important. We've heard from many community members for quite some time um, about the importance of having our staff and teachers, educators, reflect the student body. And as we've all talked about for, you know, for quite some time, that student body continues to become more and more diverse, which we all agree is a wonderful thing. Uh, we wanna ensure that our staff also continues to be diverse and reflecting our student body. Uh, but also I think the one thing that I remember us talking about, about last year and with Ms. Cunningham's leadership that I would like to see continue and enhanced is uh, professional development around uh, race in particular and identity. Uh, and identity also getting into, you know, sort of gender issues. Mm -hmm. um, because I, I believe that, you know, there's a lot of uh, learning that we can all do for um, how to become uh, better, better stewards, I guess, of our students. And this is a, goes a long way into to doing that. So I think this is a big thing for us. Um, the study of sixth grade to arms also is something that is unavoidable. Uh, and I think an important discussion, not just for this committee, but for other committees. 
And I think the, you know, the more progress we can show in thinking about this and engaging the community, the more, uh, the better that is. <coughs> so I would also, I guess, place that if I were to be prioritizing uh, somewhere near the top, but I'm not prioritizing at all. <laughs> but if um, I were. But if I were, that's, that's one of those things. Um, <laughs> And then I, I guess, you know, I, I uh, also will reflect and, and support what my colleagues have said about the athletic fields and other things like that that have come up uh, simply because it, you know, from my perspective, and I talked about this last year, um, it is an equity issue. And I think that, you know, we have um, not for, you know, the fault of any particular group of people <clears throat> necessarily, but just the way that things have worked out. Um, have not done a great job of ensuring the you know the the long term uh, health of those fields and making sure that our students get the most they can out of it. So, I really do think that it's an important issue that the community clearly cares a lot about, and that we also should care a lot about. Starting with your goals, so I think that's it probably for me. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so one of the challenges of going so late is that a lot of what I was thinking has already been said. Um, it's not a bad thing, but. Um, so I had a similar problem in terms of, well, first off, we just got these goals that I'm being asked to evaluate which ones we want to prioritize. This is very, um, I, I reserve the right to change my mind. Yes. <laughs> but, um, but what I'd like to say is that I think if you didn't do any of these, I would be I feel yeah. like you haven't done your job necessarily. Right. The only one that I could take off the list in terms of that would be the conversation around late start time, which I agree with everybody who spoke already that it's integral to wellness. However, I do think that it's something that isn't going to eat up a lot of this committee's time potentially. And maybe if we could, I'm not against it. That's what I'm trying to say. Like, I, I'm, it's not at all about my position on, on that, but I, I'm just right looking through this list of items and it is such a long list. And in terms of what um, we, we must, complete the strategic plan. I agree with the supervision, you know, that should be a priority. Like everything else on this, including that, could be a priority, but it seems like the one that I could potentially see as being optional. I don't know if that's helpful. Um, and it's not to weigh in on whether or not we should do it or not. Um, in terms of the other question I had was with the, you know, the other thing I agree is that the fields are in desperate need of improvement, but it is also something where I feel like the, um, the town of Amherst is also integrally involved, and I know we have the master planning going on. So potentially I could see somebody else kind of continuing to move that forward in your absence. Not that, um, I'm not sure I'm saying that right, but it just feels like there are other actors involved in that who could prioritize it and make it a priority. But I don't see anybody else in uh, um, taking on the role of diversifying our staff or you know, prioritizing student wellness, whereas I could see other folks prioritizing getting the fields improved, um, specifically in the town of Amherst. Um, so those are my thoughts, and thank you. So, my sure only comment would be that I think as we've um, talked about these in the past is that when they, when they think them to five was, was fair, it wasn't an overload, but it was enough. So, uh, a couple things. I mean, one, I think that we have, because we, I guess I'll say first off, I agree with the strategic plan point. There's so many things in the strategic plan, and we wanted to get one done, and we wanted to actually implement it, and we wanted to live by it. So the idea that that wouldn't be one of your goals for the year makes no sense to me at all, especially because it includes so many of the other components in it. And if we do that well, you'd be making progress on a lot of the other things. So I think that's critically important. One thing I would ask you, I guess, and you don't have to respond to it right now, mm -hmm. um, is at the point we start having more of a strategic agenda, that creates the liberty potentially for you to have some goals that are particular to your job and then other goals that you would have for the district where you may or may not be the lead actor. And so I say that because when we look at this list, it's incredibly hard to say that we shouldn't be doing any of these things. I'd actually agree with Ms. Spitzer that the one you could see sort of subordinating would probably be the late start time, not because it wouldn't be done, but if you're doing a comprehensive frame, framework on wellness, include that in there and see how that framework, including how you're organizing that work, leads you to an engaged process around start time and its role in wellness, right? I mean, it could be integral to that, yeah. in other words. Um, without without kicking the can, and I think 
part of the question managerial is how do you sequence these things so that it can be done effectively and well? And because we can't bite everything off and do it well. And I mean by we, I mean globally, all of us That's right. can't do so. And so one of the things I'd love for you to do when you go back to this list is think about whether or not you can bifurcate um, this list between things that you would include on your superintendent goals versus things that you would want to state definitively are goals for the district for this coming year. Mm -hmm. if you know what I'm getting at. Mm -hmm. um, and, and does that give you any clarity around this? I'd also say with that, I'm very interested in, in that lens, thinking through where do you play a particularly key role or is your leadership critically essential to that outcome and where is it, where is it, I don't mean it's not, but no, if you know no, what I mean, absolutely. where are there other actors that you know in fact are playing a lead role, uh, in which case you'd say we're going to get this done, but if you lifted the lid, you'd find out someone else is actually doing 95% of the work and you're bringing your vision to it where you can or your advice where you can't. Um, so just, that's just that's my advice on that. Um, it's hard to say that sixth grade at the middle school isn't going to require your chops. Yeah. Um, I also think that uh, supervision of your staff is, I think, a great thing to put on there because one of the things I've mentioned at least last year, if not two years in a row, is that I was wanting to think of ways that you could think about, it sounds awful, but this is the process, right? We're doing superintendent evaluation. Ways that you could articulate your growth as a manager, administrator, leader of a team. Yeah. And I, f I feel like in the past you've had a hard time articulating how to put that in writing in a way that feels intrinsic to your work and what you're wanting to do for the year. You're starting to do that now. I think that's a really positive thing. Yeah. And there's nothing more central to you right. than how you're doing. Um, I'd also think, div I, and, and just, you can figure this out yourself, but to me, diversity of staff and hiring and how we take the next step, because you articulated this as sort of a next step in the process, seems to me something that's hard to miss in this work. Um, I also feel the same about athletic fields, but one of my first point was I'm begging you to figure out how do you articulate something you're proposing as a, something that we are going to get done, right. and then of what that subset that are actionable, which ones are things that we, that we should be thinking about, for want of a better term, judging your performance on. Any other thoughts? Yes. I have a question. Yeah. As a, a new member again, is there some way to get information about the strategic plan? Uh, yes. Where, where, where does it reside? Um, I'll share it with the full committee tomorrow. Um, where we, This last document that you all saw, which is where we are, okay. um, I'll make sure that it um, gets shared with the full Is it on the website? It is, but it's probably... Okay, yeah, never, yeah, never mind. Yeah, never mind. I mean, I think it'd just be easier for me to share it with all of you. Okay. That way you don't have to go lucky. Thank sure. you. Welcome. So much. Uh, yeah, I, I um, neglected to talk about the sixth grade move because I would like to see that as a multi-year goal because I think it's going to necessitate conversations with the Hilltowns um, because if you start talking about moving Amherst sixth grade to the middle school, then I think there's going to be some people, at least in Leverett, we're going to be very concerned about what that, what impact that's going to have on kids who remain in Leverett. So I think it's going to require some pretty, um, a series of conversations with parents in the Hilltowns, um, as well as staff and administrators um, and the and the, the Hilltown School Committees about that shift. So I would see it as a, a multi-year mm -hmm. goal. I think if you have multi-year goals, you can articulate that back to us too. Yeah. I don't think anyone would be against that. Uh, any other thoughts from the committee? Do you have any thoughts back to us at the moment? Uh, just simply that that was exactly the type of feedback that I'm looking for, so thank you. Um, and I'll make sure that I share <coughs> uh, draft goals um, in advance of the next meeting so that any feedback that you have to make that's individual can be shared before the meeting, that if there are tweaks that you know, you'd like to make or feedback that, that can be an iterative process. Um, and we'll talk on the 10th. So uh, the next item on our agenda is around developing a calendar of agenda topics. I think it might be worth reviewing the topics on the calendar that exist, but <coughs> I, have, I have kind of a question for the committee because of the nature of the conversation we just had. Um, I, we, I would love to have a topic discussion about this today, but I'm wondering if it wouldn't also make sense for when 
Dr. Morris is coming back with his refined goals mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. for him to take a crack. And I'm also happy to sit down with him, maybe with the vice chair, to also help you figure out how we could populate a calendar that if we've just agreed we want to do all these things, mm -hmm. why don't we, we could take a crack at populating the calendar with where those things fit in the discussion so that when we come back to then look at the calendar, it could be informed by what we say we've already agreed we want to talk about mm -hmm. or, or address. Does that make any sense? If this is a cart before the horse. Yes. Only if we want to be well organized. <laughs> Only if we want to be well organized. Um, so why don't you go through what we have now? But sure. it sounds like the committee just nodded their heads. Yep. I yep. think it makes enormous sense to not belabor a subject that mm -hmm. could be better informed next time. Yep. So um, this is a full. You know, we didn't parse out Amherst and, and Pelham meeting, so just look at the, the regional ones. But the next meeting on the tenth, uh, we'll have. Um, Union 26 is planning to meet uh, on the front end of that because they haven't reorganized and there's there was an election in Pelham. Um, and so we need to, um, by policy, reorganize Union 26 level. Um, yes. And um, uh, when is your contract run? Uh, in the next year, right? Not the end of, not this coming June, but the June after. Okay. So I'm just foreshadowing because I don't see any reason not to. But another reason why we may be meeting with Union 26 is most superintendents in the universe that we live in don't like going into the last year of their contract as a lame duck when they're looking to figure out um, where they're going to be working and whether they're supported and wanted by their district. That doesn't mean we have to discuss uh, a, p a potential contract status of the superintendent, but it, um, meaning we don't have to go through the whole process if the committee decides not to. But it means it would actually be irresponsible of the committee not to raise the topic. So hence, both Mr. Demling, who's not here, but he did was actually on his little list of things to talk about uh, in the email. Um, but Mr. Demling, who's chair of Union 26 at the moment, uh, and myself thought that we needed to talk about that. Um, and then we're having a... Sorry, I apologize no. to throw that at you since you're the subject of the topic. Oh, it's all good. Um, uh, the pool contracts, we'll have that conversation after this topic, and um, we want to have a discussion tonight and potentially a vote uh, on this pool issue at the next meeting. Um, in later September, um, to the prior conversation we had tonight, the regional assessment discussion, we want to have, not wait that, that this is early on the agenda, but uh, relative to past years, but we want to have a conversation in September about where we are with that. And athletic fields update, that can take a number of forms, but just, you know, we spent a lot of time last spring talking about it, and we want to come back with how things are going. Um, I have a math update in mid-October. Um, listed student service update in October, later October. We, we, we didn't do one last one last year, but we've, in past years, often done um, department update, and so we was thinking, since we didn't do one last so year. So what is students, just, to, I, yeah, I hate yeah, shorthand yeah. conversations. What does student services include? So student services is, uh, I think, uh, it encompasses what has been thought of as special education, but it's broader than that. It also includes um, students, uh, working with students with 504 plans, the Bright program, for instance, which is, we've talked about here for students who, who are struggling with um, social emotional challenges, falls in student services. So um, those students may or may not have special education plans. So it's, it's a little more holistic look at um, a broader set of student services, not just special education. Um, the wellness committee in the past, which has mostly talked some about mental health, but some about um, a lot about nutrition, actually falls in student services as well. Nursing. Um, Thanks. Uh, you know, one thing I tried to do is having uh, once a month goals updates, so we don't do uh, like a mid year, how are we doing, but actually picking one of the goals each month and doing an update so that the committee and the community and, the, and myself and staff can actually um, pick a goal every month share an update, how are we doing on this, so that it, it becomes a more regular part of meetings instead of, uh, oh, we set the goals, may halfway through we get an update, and at the end of the year we get this artifacts document. You know, one of the things we actually tried in Pelham last year, and mm -hmm. I thought it worked swimmingly, was to kind of more routinize the fact that there are these goals and we're going to have regular discussions. By the way, if the committee has a question on any of these items, please raise your oh, hand yeah. now. I'd rather deal with them as they come up than mm -hmm. yeah. afterwards. We have a better term. Please. I'm just wondering, and this is just an idea, um, because I, I like the idea of getting regular updates on the goals, uh, but I also am cognizant that, you know, if we have eight goals or fewer than that um, at the regional level 
and then additional goals at the other committee levels that basically we're just going to be hearing one goal updated you know per month until it's time to actually review <laughs> all of them together right and, and do the evaluation so is it possible perhaps to hear about you know multiple goals it doesn't have to be all of them for every month right. for every meeting but having a few at a time at least mm -hmm. helps you get through the, the list a little more quickly and also gives that sense of continuity that I think you're aiming for. That's I think what I'd add to that comment that I agree with it is, is we, um, if we're going to do that, um, we got to go back to thinking about what the role of the committee is and what we're doing. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you're literally just providing us a verbal update on something, that's one thing. If you're actually expecting some sort of interactive feedback, we want to think about substantively how and why are we engaged in the committee? Who's involved beyond? You know what I mean? You yeah, know what I'm mm -hmm. getting at? I do. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Um, as we have done for many years, the human resources report in November, um, school calendar review. Next year is going to be a, a quirky school calendar, so I think we'll actually have to have more discussion just where Labor Day falls out. Mm -hmm. um, so that one might require a little more discussion than the average year. Um, our MSAN student conference is in late October, so this would be. Um, Maybe ambitious, might have to wait till December, but uh, you know, in the past we've liked for the students who attend the conference to come share about their experience and their goals uh, coming back and their plan. Uh, when we get to December, uh, that's the timeline for new courses at the high school to be considered by the school committee. Um, hopefully get to a place where we approve the calendar for the next year. I'm skipping over the goals updates given the prior yeah, yeah. dialogue. Um, January, we have a budget process update, um, so that's when we have our initial numbers. We, we could do it at the earlier January meeting. One of the reasons we thought about the 28th is by then, you know, hopefully the governor's budget's out, and depending what methodology we're using, having a budget uh, presentation before the governor's budget may, comes out may not be useful. So we're open to feedback on that, um, and not, not just right now, but in general, but that the thinking. Mr. Doni is the Ms. Spitzer. Thank you. Uh, so just very quickly, I was wondering if the January 14th meeting, if it would be appropriate for us to add reorganizing subcommittees at that meeting, because I'm aware that uh, Amherst will have had its uh, election early no November, but the new committee doesn't actually get seated until the 1st of January. It just seems like a good time. Or I mean, it's, it's weird, because we also have the other towns who haven't quite gone through their... Right, I'm going to interrupt. Did you finish your... No. Oh, I thought you were right, 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 you're done. Yeah. Um, so actually, that raises a larger question of, given the new timeline, when was the committee itself reorganized? Um, right. What I thought I heard you say, and maybe I heard you wrong, was about subcommittees. Mm -hmm. But are, is the committee going to reorganize twice each year, given that there's potential changeover in staff? Let's figure that out later. Yeah, yeah. No, My I just, point is you've identified an excellent yes. meeting topic. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Let's yeah, not debate it. Let's that. talk about it later. Yeah. Right. Uh, Ms. Spitzer, then I think Ms. McDonald. Um, so I was going to reorganized question mark right here in January. Um, and, but the, the, the other thing I was thinking is, you know, this will be the potentially a public document, but even just for our own planning purposes, could we add a call into this saying like major trigger event that triggers a need for something? So like town election or, you know, just it, it could help us to plan if we can put in the column here um, also key dates that may not have anything to do with the school district, um, you know, but could have a direct impact on either the budget or on our need to reorganize. So all of the town, you know, we've got four towns mm -hmm. elections. We've got um, this regional assessment question going on. Governor's forward. House won. Right. Just yeah, just yeah. yeah. So, so if we could just have, like, political event or, you know, <laughs> a column for, for, for the thing that's, like, like sparking the need for it, because I think that would really help us plan. I'm um, oh, sorry, Ms. Ms. McDonald and then Mr. Bosch. Um, Yeah, I, I wrote down, one of the things that we talked about at our retreat was the idea of a full day sort of budget meeting. And I personally really like that versus going through, particularly because we potentially will have new members, a lot of new members um, in January. So adding, at least thinking early so that we have that foresight, if that's something that the full committee wants to do, Planning that for sometime in in January potentially as a way to kick off the process. So, yeah, uh, forgive this question. I just don't know the answer to it. Um, in, in regards to organizing or reorganizing, when is the uh, one of the APEA contracts up? 
the year after the same timeline as when my contract's up, I think, right? UFCW will be. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, I'm sorry. So UFCW. United w. Food and Commercial Workers will be this this year. There, well, the, the negotiation and vote will have to happen this year. For this year, this for year next year. year. Okay. Yeah. So UFCW this year, all the rest of them, not till the following year. So we would need a negotiating team for this year, prior to the Amherst elections. Yes, for the UFCW. Uh, you need to go to the microphone, Mr. Regano. <laughs> Otherwise, I'm repeating everything you say to make sure it's heard. <laughs> it, it may be after, because if we do it prior, and then those people leave, or don't continue after the elections. I'm sure they will. <laughs> I, guess, I guess the question, I mean, honestly, this is a functional question. Yeah. If you need it sooner, we have to do it sooner. No, it's just if a you don't need, yeah. No, no, I'm just yeah. saying, if you don't need it sooner, yeah. then do it in January when you have, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Thank you. Great. Uh, so I was actually going to echo something Mr. McDonald said, but I think if, if thinking about where we can fit in a budget, budget orientation and budget process would be a good idea. I don't think we need to talk about this right now. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know if any members of the committee want to volunteer to work with Mr. Mangano to sort of revise and look at how we're doing our budget. Anyone? I'm very pleasant. <laughs> no, I know you are. Um, do we have a budget committee? Uh, we do have yeah. a budget committee. You're on the budget committee, right? Aren't you on the committee? No, I'm on. No, oops. I'm on Ron's on the committee. Yes, I, answer. I would be interested in being involved, actually. I'm a new member, but. Yeah, you so need, I don't know you if need that... a committee. Uh, do you want to. Let me just come back up, please. I'm sorry. I apologize. <laughs> um, I just want to do this in an organized fashion, and I don't want us to be debating here stuff we need to do later. Um, do you want to do you want to look at a rev, uh, soon some sort of revised calendar for the budget process that could take into account things we've talked about? Mm -hmm. Okay. Am I just going to send that back to you? No, you're going to go to the committee. You're going to meet oh, with your budget committee. finance. Yeah, you're going to okay. the committee. Right. Exactly. Is that okay? We may not have a committee. Um, what do you mean? A couple of people are gone that were on it last. Oh, I think Ron is on the committee. <laughs> Carrie's on the committee. I think those are the only two because I think Audra was on it. And, and Ms. Stancer could join. Kara was on it. I volunteered. She, yeah. So are three people enough for three a people are perfect. Yeah. See what and, and so just maybe on the September 10th we could review subcommittee assignments. I think we need to. Okay. Sounds like we need to. But I mean, but the point is, prior to that, yeah, you're now on the budget and audit committee. By the way, the blessing <laughs> is you get to be on both, uh, and, and then OPEP. and you have three <laughs> and OPEP, the OPEP board, and you have three members. And the three members are going to work with you soon to develop the calendar. Because as you may recall, for people who have been around the block already, we started dealing with budget issues earlier in the fall than just December or January. We started actually having meetings to talk about it in like September and October. And we might want to again. So we're going to work on that. Cool. Yes. Uh, yeah. So just a reminder also, <clears throat> I was just looking at the stuff that was actually on here before instead of adding additional things, but uh, the school committee roles and responsibilities that we just talked about, um, I'm looking at the September 10th meeting and wondering if that would be going on there or are you thinking about the one after? Uh, I want to say the one after only because the, the policy time. subcommittee just got this assignment. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so they, they the agree. <laughs> so September 24th. Okay. Needs to be early in the year, otherwise yeah. it loses its punch. Obviously. Thank you. So, Superintendent, go ahead. Yep. So, I'm in February, budget presentation and hearing, including ads cuts, school choice hearing. And then in March, we have a budget vote, school choice vote. And we talked last year about doing the evaluation, which, which I don't want to debate here, but just it's one of the things that we should come back to, perhaps with that subcommittee, um, doing this evaluation before the town elections in the three in three of the four towns. There's some upside and downside to that. I think it's worthy of a discussion, and you know, the committee subcommittee would want to meet with me. I'm happy to share my two cents there, but I think that actually is something that we sh should sort out um, collectively sooner as opposed to later. Okay. Um, and then I just said clerical media awards. And I intentionally left, I think as my email indicated, there's based on the goals, and, and I think Mr. Nakajima spoke to this earlier, we'd want to round out this calendar based on the feedback I received and what the goals are so that we're slotting items to occur multiple times throughout the year. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, any additional 
feedback on this right now. As I said, I think the goal, the not to pun it or whatever, but the goal we would have, the objective we'd have, would be for you to do whatever thinking you need to do, a superintendent, yeah. and then for you to set up a meeting, probably yeah. get it on the book sooner than later, right. that I could work with myself and Ms. McDonald to sit down with you and try to, we're not going to go through your proposed goals, meaning right. whether the committee likes them or not, we'll decide together. Mm -hmm. I just want to help knock into shape a calendar that if you're going to propose this to us, that what, that we can then come, you can come back also, or we could come back, you and I come back with a draft right. of what the year might look like as a, as a next starting point. Mm -hmm. Is that okay? Sounds mm -hmm. great. Does that make sense to the committee? Yep. Yes. <clears throat> okay. And I think it'll also, the nice thing is it'll have a forcing item that we may, we will, if we need to leave things out because we can't get them done with the full calendar, we could, that forces that conversation. What's in, what's out. Okay. Great. So we're done with that. That sounds good. Uh, Mr. Mangano, you're up. Um, Superintendent, if you have anything to introduce on this item, that's great. Otherwise, um, I think, uh, yeah, I'll do a very brief introduction, which is... And we're on Tritons, by the way. Yes. Um, <coughs> that we received a request, um, and it was in the packet from a community organization, and because of the scope of the request, uh, we communicated back with the organization that on a temporary basis we would... Uh, fulfill the request, but we felt like um, this went a little beyond the scope of um, just staff decisions that we want to actually bring this to the, the committee because it's a significant increase in use and the request um, is, is atypical compared to other community organizations in terms of the scope, the hours, and then the finances. So we didn't want to make any permanent decisions without the full committee weighing in and, and potentially voting at the next meeting with the thoughts that you have on it. Okay, so there's a memo in the packet, mm -hmm. just for the sake of the fact that people are going to be watching on TV. That was almost a completely proper nounless explanation of what we're doing, with very few verbs in it. <laughs> so if you could make sure people at home understand what we're talking about, <laughs> please help. So a little historical context. Six years ago, there was like no activity in the pool in middle school. And the town meeting raised year after year, we need to use the pool more, get LCC in there. You go there now, it's like every day there's people in the pool. There's people in the pool right now probably because they're, they're, we did a temporary agreement with them just so they could get started for the season. Um, so what this is, um, the Amherst Tritons are a local swim team in Amherst, and I think they include Beyond Amherst. And they have used our pool a little bit the last several years. Um, typically after school, for um, LCC is the first one that uses our pool for a couple hours after school, and then the Tritons go in after them until about 9 o'clock. Um, they used our pool at the middle school, but they also use Topman's at UMass. I don't know if you've read, but Topman's is closing. Yeah. So they want to use our pool much more often. Um, they've been a really great partner, and their numbers, from what I hear, are really growing. There's a lot of energy around the swim team. They do really good work. Um, so they made a proposal to us in terms of like the, the times that they would like to use the pool. Um, in terms of conflict, I don't think there's any conflict that I can see in terms of them pushing people out of the pool right now. Um, but because of the scope of how many hours they want to use, it increases the license fee. So what we do is a license agreement with them. Um, so it's basically year to year. Um, it doesn't have any property rights or anything like that. It's basically you can use this space as long as you're a good user of the space. If we ever decide to change our mind, we can sort of do it with two weeks' notice. Um, so this sort of lays out basically the proposal, which is to use the pool roughly 1,200 hours throughout the year. It's um, Monday through Friday, Saturday and Sunday as well. Um, so pretty much every day except for holidays, they're very dedicated <laughs> to, to, the, to the sport. Um, our hourly rate that we have come up with this year for the pool is $30 an hour. So that's what LCC is paying for the hours they use. We took that rate and applied it to what um, the trains are proposed, and it comes out with a total fee of about $37,000, um, which is quite a bit, obviously. It's a pretty big number, and it did jump from last year for them because the hours went up so much. Um, They've come back to us after hearing what the fee was and have not demanded, but just requested if we could consider um, a donation of some equipment to help offset some of the fee. Um, I've laid out what the equipment is here. I have an open question that, I'm sorry, Ms. McDonald, I don't have the answer to yet. Um, <laughs> like, do we want this equipment? So there's that piece of it, like, can we use this? Is it gonna, do we already have this equipment? Is it gonna <coughs> be useful for us? Um, so that I don't have the answer to yet. Uh, but you've got the as much information as I have here in terms of what the equipment costs, the age of it, the condition of it, that type of thing. Okay, I want to do the same thing. Run around the table, see if there are questions for you. This is, again, a discussion item. We'll be voting on it if we choose to next time. 
Yeah. You charge a school team to use the pool? Not a school team. It's a, a private local the swim team. The Tritons is those. Yeah, it's not the school swim team. Oh. Yeah, any other, any other, I'm going to go around and see if people have questions or comments. Either one. It could be questions or comments. I have a Sensor. question. Um, how much is this going to increase the staff time to take care of the pool? Yeah, so that's, I mean, that's one of the reasons why we charge is particularly on the weekends, it's going to mm -hmm. result in overtime because we don't typically, we wouldn't typically have custodians on the weekends, so that would be somewhere between 30, 35 bucks an hour um, for custodians to be there on the weekends. Um, so somewhat significant. Okay. Yeah. Please, Mr. Um, Sean, in, in your judgment, um, given the age of some of these donate of all the donations, are you confident that they will, um, that they're worth taking in kind? Um, or I don't have the expertise to make that comment <laughs> right now. Um, I think the it really comes down to um, we've talked to the swim coach and I've talked to the new athletic director to look at it. Um, I know we have some sort of scoreboard in there. We have some equipment in there. Um, so it's really I think it's dependent on what they think in terms of whether we can use it or not. Okay, thanks. That wasn't a great answer. I yeah. Thank you. Um, I, I asked some questions by email, but I, I will just say I don't I don't. Um, just to hear any conflict of interest, but my son used to be a swimmer on Amherst Tritons. He's no longer a swimmer, and he's not continuing um, with Amherst Tritons, so I just want to put that out there. But. And I want to reiterate, they're a great partner. We love having them in the, in the pool. So, again, this is just merely it was just such a big uptick. We wanted to make you all aware of it and, and see if you have any concerns about it. I'm going to switch this thing up and go to the other end of the table. Ask Mr. Sullivan if he has any questions. I'm good. Okay. Spitzer? Um, well, I guess given the overuse of the fields problem that we're facing right now, I want to make sure we don't end up with an overuse of the swimming pool no, it's a really issue. Good, so it's a really good point. Um, I don't know. Um, I don't know how we'd. We, so we've had a little bit of an overuse. Yeah. Uh, so when we first had a big uptick in pool usage, there was like a week span where the DPW who we work with really close to pool use as well. Um, you know, coincidentally. Um, it took a little bit to get the right balance. Now that we have so many more people in the pool and, and mm -hmm. teach people to make sure they shower and things like that before they get in the pool, it took a little bit and there actually was a week where we had to shut the pool down. Um, that's just what we have to do if the pool gets to a place where it's not safe, we shut it down until it gets to that place. Um, this past year, we had no issues um, that I heard of. I had, we had a little debrief meeting about the pool um, and I don't think there was any issues with um, the usage of the pool. Now, as you mentioned, there's gonna be a big uptick, so it's something we'll have to monitor. I guess my other concern is just like this is a limited public resource. There aren't a lot of other pools that mm -hmm. are open to the public, and given that Tritons is a private team, it almost seems like rather than accepting equipment, it would almost be like could we get scholarships for kids to use the pool? Mm -hmm. It just seems like, um, I, and I, again, I don't have any knowledge of how the Tritons team is financed or who's on the team and, and things like that, but there just seems to me some, you know, it's a public resource that if the Tritons are using it, the school lessons can't happen there, open swim can't happen there, um, you know, other things that may be more um, open to everybody in our community. So I, my two concerns are the overuse um, impact on the facility and then the potentially limiting access to other um, members of our community who may not be part of the swim team. You know, maybe, I don't, it is being used for open swim right now. Yeah, let's see how it does the open swim. And that would be open to anybody, given, whatever age, whether or not they're competitive or not, right? I think so. I think they have different yeah. times yeah. for So I just, I just want to make stuff, sure right? we're not unintentionally excluding other who yeah. might not have access to a pool otherwise, mm -hmm. because they're just not a lot of Yeah, I typically go to LCC first to see what they want for a schedule, just because they're in the building, um, you know, they're obviously a partner of ours. Um, so they've set, at least for this year, they've let us know what their schedule is with their budget. Um, so. So they're sort of first, and then Tritons have done a good job of working around them, and also working around our actual swim team. We, in the license agreements we have with both of them, it always says that if there's any conflict between them and our, our actual swim team, that our swim team will have a priority. Uh, so I also uh, just want to disclose for the committee and for the public that my son was swimming on the Amherst Tritons. Um, he took a break and he hasn't quite gotten back on yet, but we're assuming that he will. So I will not be voting on this item. Um, but I do have some questions that I wanted to raise just as part of this conversation. You mentioned the usage hours uh, for 1,237 and a half. Is that per month, per quarter? That's throughout the whole year. The entire year. Yeah. So that because so the, the basically <clears throat> um, it's end of it's August through um, 
there's like a one month break. It's either July or August. Right. They have two seasons. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So this would be both seasons, yeah. August. It's going to be the full annual. Through. Okay. Thank you. That's actually really helpful. And then uh, my second question was just also related to the LSSC um, and how they would react to this change, given the fact that they actually are paying, you know, $30 an hour. Um, <clears throat> I don't know how much off the top of my head they contribute to this, um, the budget for the pool, but mm -hmm. I can't imagine that they would be very happy about paying for something that another team is not paying for. <laughs> Uh, you mean in terms of if we did an exchange for some equipment? Exactly. Okay. Yeah, that's, that's a, we can speak. To, uh, knowing, I won't speak to them. We can reach out to them and see just what their thoughts are on that. I think it would be really important. And I also just want to reiterate uh, Ms. Spitzer's uh, comments, which is extremely important, just about um, making sure that we're not using a public resource for a private team, mm -hmm. even though it's a wonderful team yeah. and the people who run it are amazing and you know many of our students are actually on that yeah, team. Exactly. Um, and it has grown, as you mentioned. Uh, at the same time, the LSSC and having that, that public resource open to the community more broadly is, is a very different opportunity mm -hmm. than the swim team taking it um, even for a few hours of sure. a week would do. So I really think it's important for us to get um, an answer from mm -hmm. LSSC. Mm -hmm. You have something you're gonna. Oh, I think I'll wait. Thank you. Okay. So, uh, a couple things. One, um, well, I'm skeptical, by the way, of the value of the of the equipment. Sure. This and is the so, initial cost, yeah. No, I understand that, but I'm just saying I'm skeptical about it. I guess the other question I have is, do we know how much they're paying the University of Massachusetts to use Tottenham, yeah. and how does what they're being asked? I mean, if they're using our facilities for the same number of hours that they were otherwise using. UMass and they're not increasing their practice mm -hmm. schedule or whatever, then the question would be, is our amount that we charge significantly more onerous mm -hmm. than what UMass was paying? And what I would wonder is, is, is the, if there is a discount rate, I mean, if we think that's an appropriate thing to offer, is there a discount rate that we could offer associated with matching UMass's price mm -hmm. given the volume of the, of the time? Because otherwise, I mean, writing off, um, I need glasses. Uh, writing off, you know, sixteen thousand dollars of rental time or something like that—that's a lot of money, mm -hmm. and that's an enormous number of hours. And frankly, it doesn't make any sense to me, unless unless the feedback from UMass was, oh, they let us use Tottenham for free, or it was for a you know minimal amount of money, like mm -hmm. five bucks an hour or something like that. So I just I don't know what the answer to that question yeah, is. But if you don't have it, we can bring it back. We, we really honestly, I think we need the answer to that question. The other question I'd be interested in knowing is, if you haven't already, I'd love for you to talk to the maintenance staff that is actually charged with cleaning the pool and cleaning the pool and locker room area to try to understand whether, even if we pay people, is there some additional burden? Like, are we going to have to find someone else to work on the weekends for swing time because it's actually too burdensome for them to work the additional hours? Mm -hmm. Uh, I mean, if the answer may be, no, no, we've talked to them, it's cool, we have staff. But, I mean, absent that, I'd really want to know that answer to that question, too. Um, Dr. Morris, and then I saw Mr. Menino and Mr. Fox. Yeah, so I think just combining what I was going to say earlier, I'm glad I waited, was that uh, one of the things that is challenging for us, I think the part about UMass and the comparison is a good one, but this came up with the farmer's market as well a couple of years ago, is that the nature of our schools is that it's generally closed on the weekend. So if we want to open them on the weekend, that involves paying a custodian to be there. And other organizations that are open for seven days, they have custodial staff that are on a routine basis there. And, and so we do incur additional costs that, you know, compared to the, and it's a, not a great comparison, but I think in this way it's relevant, compared to the Hampshire Mall, if the farmer's market wants to be there instead of the middle school, the, the mall's open on the weekend and our schools aren't. So we have to incur additional costs that other organizations may not have to. So I think it's just an additional variable of data to bring Can I add to something to that too, by yeah, the way? Yeah. It builds on what I was saying yeah. a little bit. Um, under no circumstances whatsoever should the district be incurring any costs to yes. support this. Right. So I, I mean, I'm, I'm skeptical or dubious about the value right. for the equipment to be donated, but even if we think we can or should write down what we're charging them based on some donation of equipment, in no circumstance at all could the amount that that's written down go below the amount we need to pay right. to keep up the pool. Mm -hmm. I mean, I mean, I'm assuming. And the point is, I, I'm just going to be blunt about this. My, I'm saying this right now. I'm not going to vote in favor of the contract next time unless I have answers to those questions and we've done the math yeah. and we figured it out. 
Because otherwise, it's not a responsible decision on our part, yep. in my opinion. Sorry, Mr. Mr. Mino and then Mr. Fong. What is the duration of the contract? It'll be one year. So much? Okay. Yeah, I, uh, yeah, I'm, I don't have my policy handbook, but I thought we had a policy on public use of schools. Do we? There is a procedure, and there's a facility use um, guideline, we, yeah. but we're, we're at... A, when that was written, the pool wasn't on there. So the pool, at least last time I looked at it, wasn't on there because it wasn't being used widely. Um, and it provides some leeway to the um, administration facility director when there's like a long-term, it has like one single-use fees, which are pretty high. And if you apply them to a, a long-term thing, it would really be not manageable. Um, so there is, but it, it doesn't really speak to this type of thing. But there is a procedure that talks about prioritizing school teams over um, outside groups and things like that. Um. Uh, forgive me for not remembering the wording of the policy, but does the policy allow for treating one community group different from another? Is there, the, or not treat them differently? It has different tiers of community groups, but I think within that your tier, you're supposed to be treated equally. And one last question: In your judgment, should the policy be looked at again for possible revisions? Yeah, it's something that the facility director and I have been talking about for a while. The policy and, in addition, the, the actual facility use proceed, like the, the thing that we put on the website so outside groups know what they're going to pay and how it works, that needs to be looked at and updated. Thank you. So are, they, I mean, are there any other factual questions? Because I know you need to go. We need to move on on the agenda. And also you're going to come back to us with a bunch of stuff. Um, I think you're, you welcome emails if uh -huh. there are questions from the committee. Yeah. Otherwise, uh, great. Okay. All right, so um, don't go anywhere. <laughs> So the next item on our agenda, uh, and I think, uh, I think, given the fact we've talked a lot about committee planning, I think the last item on our agenda, uh, other than gifts, is going to be uh, the year update, yep. budget update. And this is all good news. Um, so this is just an update of the FY20 budget from a revenue perspective, what we budgeted for revenue sources versus what we're actually expecting now that the state budget is finalized. So if you look at that little chart, um, really the areas that fluctuate a little bit our state aid. So Chapter 70 is coming in about $7,000 higher than what we had budgeted. Transportation reimbursement is coming in about $29,000, possibly more. Um, this is based on what we received last year. There was some um, increases to transportation reimbursement during this last process so that even could come in a little bit higher. Um, Medicaid reimbursement's flat, and then charter reimbursement. So the charter reimbursement's coming in quite a bit higher, um, just due to two things. One. Their reimbursement number is based on more students going to charter school than what we projected for our number. It's like two or three kids, but it makes a pretty big difference in terms of the amount. Um, but also, when we did our FY20 budget, there was still discussion about what formula the governor or the, the state budget was going to use to reimburse schools for charter tuition. There was that whole enrollment versus tuition thing. Um, so we took the conservative approach and based it on if they went the wrong way with that. Um, but it looks like they went the positive way with that, so it's going to be based on actual tuition increases and not enrollment increases. Um, so that's why that number came in so much better. Uh, but that number, just if you're thinking about what numbers could change significantly, that's the number that could change significantly for the charter reimbursement, and it would be driven by enrollment if it changes. Yes, ma'am. Is this a blip or will it continue? A blip in terms of good news blip? Or? Good news blip. Um, I think it's, I mean, I don't think it's even a blip. I think it's pretty. This is sort of normal, I think, for this time of year. We're usually a little conservative on the Chapter 70 and the transportation reimbursement. And the charter number is really, at this early in the year, it's really sort of, it's just what they're telling us, but I think it's going to change by the, the, the first quarter report. Okay. Are there any questions for Mr. McGowan? It's obviously one of many conversations we'll have on finance and budget. Yes, Mr. Hodge. Um, looking at the reserves, can you explain the difference between formulas? I probably knew it at one point. Mm -hmm. I don't remember now. The difference between the budget support and contingency, yeah. and are both of those numbers adequate to cover the purposes for the for the lines? Mm -hmm. So E and D is the the district's reserve fund. Um, we pull money out each year to support the budget, and our goal is always to put that much money back in at the end of the year so that our reserve fund stays flat. Um, and a tip, the E and D typically funds contingencies within our or reserves within our budget so that it can go back if they're not used. Um, so there's two categories. There's the E and D for budget support. Um, the 650, that's how much is really sort of supporting the budget um, that is part of expense accounts that will get potentially used throughout the year. Um, the one below that, e &D for contingency, 280, that's really your contingency. That's if something really bad happens during the year. 
and the district needs extra money that it doesn't have within its regular operating budget, we would come to you and say, can we access this 280? Um, we do it every year as part of the budget process because if we didn't set aside this 280 as part of the budget process, you'd have to go back to the towns to try to get more E&D at that point. So we vote it as sort of a contingency for you all so that if this was a, a really bad event, um, we could tap into it. So a couple of years ago, we had the flood of the gym here at the high school. Mm. Fortunately, we didn't end up having to tap into it, but that would have been like a good example of what would we do that year to cover it. It could have come from something like this. Um, so that 280, um, since I've been here, except for maybe once for a really small amount, we've never used. It just comes out um, and for the budget and then goes back in at the end of the year. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, any other questions for Fungana? Okay, seeing none, thank, thank you, you very much. By the way, is, do you have a legal warrants need to be signed? Yes. 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 Yeah. Yeah. Thank you for asking. <laughs> sort of saying that for the rest of the committee's benefit. I appreciate but it. I think it's sat there for the entire <laughs> meeting because um, people are paying attention with rapt attention. Uh, all right, I think we've already done future committee planning. So unless somebody wants to raise their hand and wave, I'm moving on from that item. Great. So we do have gifts. Um, would somebody like to read the gifts? Make a motion in other words and read the gifts, please. Ms. Morgan, yes. I move to approve the following gifts to the Amherst Pelham Regional School Committee uh, from donor anonymous number 56018081221 to support arms at principal discretion in the amount of $10. Uh, from David and Lisa Rutherford, check number 1447 to support the Amherst Regional High School golf team in the amount of $1,000. From anonymous number 56018298585 to support uh, the middle school at principal discretion in the amount of $10. From Susan Hanley, check number 266 to support Robert Hanley scholarship in the amount of $6,000. And from Lisa and Matt Kane, number 2361, to support the field hockey donation in the amount of $800 for a total of $7,820. And then also in compliance with state regulations regarding the receipt of gifts, um, a grant uh, from the Amherst Education Foundation to support the middle school sensory room in the amount of $4,200 for a total of $4,200. So it's been moved. Is there a second? Second. Moved and seconded. Any further questions? Any debate? Seeing none, all those in favor, please signify by raising your hand. Carries unanimously, eight to zero. Um, I'll also entertain a further motion. Move to adjourn. It's moved to adjourn. It's second. <laughs> it's second. Second. Moved and seconded. This is not debatable. All those in favor of adjournment, raise your hand. Eight to nothing. We are adjourned. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, thank you Amherst Media.